Hello and welcome to this fifth session of the Constitution Unit's 2023 Summer Conference on the Future of the Constitution. In this session, we're looking particularly at constitutional standards. I'm Meg Russell, I'm Director of the Constitution Unit, and I'll be chairing this session. I'm sure few people here require reminding of the importance or recent prominence of constitutional standards and their regulation. In the UK, like many other democracies, standards regulators of various kinds are important to maintaining a healthy democracy. They include a plethora of bodies, several of which have been unusually prominent in recent years. To give just a few examples, Boris Johnson lost two independent advisors on ministerial interests to resignation. The public appointments rules have come under strain. The powers of the House of Lords Appointments Commission have been brought into question. The toothlessness of the Advisory Committee on Business Appointments, or COBA, has been noted over the Sue Gray case and most recently Boris Johnson's adoption as a columnist at the Daily Mail. And of course, the former Prime Minister has been castigated by the House of Lords Privileges Committee back in the news again today. The Committee on Standards in Public Life, CSPL, originally established in John Major's time, completed its Standards Matter Review in 2021. This recommended various changes to strengthen the standards system, but the government's taken little action. So looking ahead, what should happen? What should Sunak's government do? And what should parties promise ahead of the next election and hope to put into effect? We want to stick as far as possible to the positives here, thinking about practical changes that could be made. And to explore those matters, we're joined by a top class panel. Uh, uh, Lord Anderson of Ipswich, David Anderson is a crossbench peer. He's a barrister and former independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. He's become a major voice on all things constitutional in the House of Lords, and is currently sponsoring a private member's bill to put CSPL's recommendations into law in the absence of government action to do so. Dr. Hannah White is director of the Institute for Government. She's a former parliamentary clerk and a former secretary to CSPL, and she's written extensively both on parliament and on standards. She's an increasingly prominent public voice on things constitutional and a regular collaborator. So it's great to welcome you back, Hannah. Jeremy Wright MP is Conservative MP for Kenilworth and Southam and a former Attorney General, also a former member of CSPL until last year. Jeremy spoke at this panel at last year's conference shortly after having delivered a rather devastating letter calling for Boris Johnson to go. Like Hannah, he's been a good friend of the Constitution Unit and the two served together on the advisory committee for our Democracy in the UK After Brexit project. So it's great to welcome you back, Jeremy, as well. Each of the speakers is going to make opening remarks for just about five minutes in that order, and then we'll have some discussion on the panel before opening it up to audience questions. Questions are being gathered today by Tom Fieldhouse, who you can also see on your screen. If you've got a question you'd like to put to the panel, please write it in the Q&A function rather than the chat, and Tom's then going to select from among the questions and read some out. If you'd like to ask your question anonymously, you can do so uh, by clicking when you submit. Like all panels at this conference, uh, this panel is being recorded and it'll be posted online soon, including the Q&A part. It will also appear as a Constitution Unit podcast. So do bear that in mind when deciding whether to anonymize your question. That's more than enough from me. We're going to pass over to our first speaker, who is David Anderson. David. Well, thank you very much, Meg. Uh, I'm delighted to have been asked to be on this panel uh, because it seems to me that almost the most important constitutional question of all uh, is how we improve standards in public life and public perceptions of those standards. And that's because if the population is disenchanted uh, about things like that, uh, or even cynical about them, then it doesn't really matter what other clever constitutional reforms you introduce in terms of separation of powers or uh, electoral systems uh, or whatever. Uh, nothing will help give the system legitimacy if the system is not trusted. And we are, I'm afraid, um, dangerously far along that road. Um, there have been a number of uh, recent surveys. I think the Constitution Unit did one, Spotlight on Corruption did another. Uh, the figure that uh, really struck me is that uh, only one in three Brits trust the government, um, compared to uh, an average of admittedly only 41%, but still considerably more among OECD countries. And I think it's not, not just a question of, uh, of the public. There are business arguments as well um, for improving standards. And when Moody's and Standard uh, and Poor downgraded uh, the UK's credit rating to a negative outlook, they referred to concerns about the UK's weakened institutions and uh, governance. Uh, and concerns from the business community about the quality of governance 
uh, influenced the UK's fall um, to its lowest ever position in Transparency International's um, Corruption Perception uh, Index. It fell from 11th to 18th place in January um, uh, of this year. Of course, um, we don't want to overdo it. We don't want witch hunts that drive good people away uh, from the idea of a career in politics or public life. Uh, we do need transparency, accountability, uh, and independent processes for dealing with wrongdoing. And I think they would go a long way towards remedying the deficit in trust. Um, looking at it very broadly, um, and I, I claim you know, less expertise uh, in this than, than other members of the panel, and indeed our chair, uh, but it does seem to me that Parliament is further along this virtuous road than um, government, partly, of course, as a result of, of past scandals. So we had the expenses scandal in 2009. We now have IPSA and uh, the, the issue of expenses seems uh, broadly under control. On standards, we have the Independent Commissioner of Standards uh, and we have a standards committee whose status, uh, I would say, uh, has been greatly enhanced um, by recent events. Uh, and we have a new code of conduct for MPs, uh, which, as I understand it, has strengthened the prohibition on giving paid uh, parliamentary advice following the, uh, the Owen Patterson affair. Of course, there are parliamentary matters that do need attention. Um, one that I'm acutely conscious of is the, the system for appointments um, to the House of Lords. Um, the irony is that none of these people who supposedly give three million pounds to their political party in exchange for a period actually ever turn up to do any debating. So it can't be said that they have very much influence on the content of our laws, uh, but they do have a, a terrible influence on public perception of what we're about. And then I'd say also the uh, continued potential for foreign money to influence um, elections. We feel pretty strongly in the House of Lords uh, that if parties take uh, foreign donations, they should provide the Electoral Commission with an annual statement setting out the details of those donations, whether they come directly or through an intermediary, and um, that intermediary should be identified. We're currently locked in ping pong on that subject with the Commons uh, in the course of the National Security Bill. So far, no quarter has been given. Um, I don't know whether it will. Turning to government, uh, the starting point, I think, is, is the two big reports uh, that we saw in 2021. Um, the Boardman report, which made a number of recommendations and suggestions for improving standards uh, following uh, an inquiry commissioned by government in the light of the, the Greensill affair. And then the one you've already mentioned, Meg, the Standards Matters uh, st sorry, Standards Matter 2 report of the Committee on Standards in Public Life, uh, which made uh, 34 recommendations, many of them around the ministerial code and the various um, watchdogs. Uh, the central recommendation, uh, I think um, Jeremy may, may disagree, but uh, I think it may have been number two, uh, that the independent advisor on ministers' interests, uh, the Public Appointments Commissioner, and the Advisory Commission on Business Appointments, ACOBA, uh, should be placed on a statutory basis. And it should be said there's been a lot of support uh, for a number of those recommendations, um, both from um, within Parliament, the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee of the House of Commons, but also internationally. Um, there is some overlap with various Council of Europe recommendations of, of 2017 to prevent corruption and uh, promote uh, integrity. Well, in May 2022, the government revised the ministerial code uh, and published a policy statement which set out their opposition uh, to the statutory regulation of uh, ministers. And my private members bill that you were kind enough to mention, it's called the Public Service Integrity and Ethics Bill. And of course, it's online. Uh, it gives effect to some of the central um, CSPL recommendations. So it would put those three regulators on a statutory basis. Um, the three that I mentioned, the Independent Advisor, the Public Appointments Commissioner and ACOBA. It would make the appointment processes for those roles more independent. Um, it would give them the powers to initiate investigations uh, and determine breaches and it would give statutory footing to their corresponding uh, rules and codes. Um, that's very far from the whole range of recommendations made by the CSPL, but I think it does correspond with those recommendations that the CSPL itself uh, wished to see implemented by statute. Uh, it's not inconceivable, of course, um, that if we ever get as far as uh, debates on this bill, and I should say I'm still waiting for a second reading, um, other recommendations uh, could be introduced by way of uh, amendment. I should say I'm proud to be associated with this bill, but I claim very little credit for it. It's been expertly drafted by Daniel Greenberg, and my understanding, Meg, is that uh, you uh, and other great experts have contributed very much more to it than I have. That's probably enough for my first five minutes. Wait till the second reading, David, and um, you'll be contributing plenty. Uh, we look forward to it. Um, okay, let's pass to uh, Hannah. Um, 
we're trying to be positive here. And I think you've probably got some thoughts about what needs to be done in the future, not least because Hannah and I have been talking about some of these things. So the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Meg. Um, and thank you for inviting me to join you here today. Um, so I think from what um, Meg has said in, in well, my words of introduction and, and uh, what uh, David has, has said, I think uh, we've clearly established the um, what we perceive, I think, have a high level of agreement on the on some of the problems. And so I wanted to talk a bit about um, what some of the answers might be, uh, having been instructed to be very positive. Um, I think, you know, I think, as I say, there's a high degree of uh, um, agreement generally that the sort of idea that we have a principles based system of standards where the good chaps will sort of do the right thing uh, is uh, is no longer quite the world in which we are are living, um, and there are there are different explanations for that. Um, but uh, why have you why have you think it's where we've got to? I think we're more in a world where politicians have have been inclined to say, "Where is the rule that tells me I can't do X?" Um, to ignore the rules sometimes that do exist, um, and as we. You know, the, I often sort of find myself on a panel saying today seems a good day to talk about this issue because something's happened. But there is rarely a day that isn't a good day, unfortunately, to talk about this issue. But of course, we have um, the recent uh, news about about um, Boris Johnson's decision not to to uh, follow a Cobra's uh, um, the Cobra process in in taking uh, taking new jobs, having left Parliament. Um, and the Privileges uh, Committee report today. Um, so, so if rules do exist, they're not necessarily to be followed. Um, and then in some instances worse, there's a willingness uh, to actively undermine the systems that do exist. So rather than just not follow the rule yourself, also um, claim that the rules um, on processes are fundamentally unjust. And I'm not in that saying that, you know, these, these things are sacrosanct, but um, attacking a process once it's produced a, a, an outcome you don't like, um, I think is, is problematic. So I think we need to think about how we change um, the incentives for people operating within the system and how we empower these different aspects of, of the system to, to be more effective in this, in this context. Um, and while I think, you know, coming up with a big bang answer um, is an attractive uh, proposition, I, I think just as the problems we've seen in the constitution have, have and constitutional standards have no single route. Um, you might say there's been a bit of a sort of death by a thousand cuts type um, situation. There is no single answer that is going to solve this. So I think in our in our system, we need to think about lots of different ways in which to, to support and, and, and bolster the, the system of constitutional standards. And I want to sort of group those into three main areas. So I think there's a set of things as, as David has already very clearly set out around codification, not moving to a you know, fully written constitution or anything like that, but aspects where the rules clearly need to be given a firmer footing and the institutions need to be given a firmer footing. There's a set of things around clarity, uh, making the rules um, and, 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 and standards by which people are expected to pay clearer. And then I think there's a set of things around consequences. So I'll run through those super quickly because I know I've only got five minutes. So in terms of codification, as I say, David set out some of the, there's again, quite a lot of different organisations who've made similar proposals, including the Institute for Government, uh, around putting the uh, independent advisor and uh, ACBA and so on onto a statutory footing to make them more secure as institutions. Uh, we at the IFG have, um, have proposed that the civil service itself would benefit from having a stronger statutory footing because some of the friction that we've seen between ministers and civil servants and growing in, in, in recent months and years is we think in part to do with a lack of clarity in accountabilities and responsibilities between ministers and civil servants. And we think that would be beneficial for both sides if it was clearer uh, who is responsible for what um, and therefore who should be held accountable for what. Um, and then, uh, as David also mentioned, um, strengthening the independence of key institutions through um, uh, making in, uh, appointments processes and so on more uh, independent. 
um, and possibly linking them more closely to Parliament to give them that element of, of, of independence. So these are the things around sort of codifying aspects of the system a bit more strongly. Then I think there's a, the set, a set of things we need to do around clar clarity and clarification, um, making sure, and this does relate back to the civil service statute point, that the, the rules of different actors in the system are, are really clear and, and firmly understood. Cabinet manual, as again, many different organizations have pointed out, desperately needs to be updated. Um, and the, we have proposals around how the ministerial code needs to be um, made clearer by taking out a lot of the administrative um, uh, detail that's within there and, and having the, the standards and the, and the expectations in terms of um, ministerial standards clearly stand alone there. And then we also have uh, post-boardman, uh, which um, uh, David mentioned, a set of proposals around improving the uh, transparency of government uh, in order to drive up standards uh, around declarations of interests. Uh, meetings and so on by ministers and senior civil servants and special advisors. So these are the sort of clarity aspects. And then finally, I think consequences are actually really important within standard systems. People need to think that if um, they do inadvertently or deliberately breach rules which or, or are seen to have contravened principles which exist, that there will be consequences for that. And it won't always be the case that you can say, Oh, well, the system, you know, I, this is an, this is a illegitimate system, and therefore I'm somehow going to to walk away from the the, the uh, those rules. I think for that reason, it's completely independently of the individual involved, the fact that the process of the privileges committee uh, was allowed to um, uh, to take place, and that Parliament took a decision for itself on Boris Johnson's behaviour was really Im important. You know that whether this is a journalist interacting with Parliament, an MP, or indeed the Prime Minister, if somebody impedes Parliament in doing its work, it's really important that Parliament can take a view uh, on whether that has happened or not, and that there are consequences um, to that uh, if, if, it is, if Parliament makes that determination. That's just one example. But um, I think that, uh, the, that a world in which uh, consequences are, are ultimately flexible if you are the right person or, or know the right person. It's not a world in which people are really incentivized to behave well. So um, those are my three kind of areas in which I think um, we, we probably need to uh, build lots of uh, different interventions uh, in order to, to try to move forward in terms of constitutional standards. That's great, Hannah. Thank you very much. And I think you get across very nicely some of the sort of complexities about the interaction between culture and structure. Um, and it would be interesting to hear a bit more about that from Jeremy, how that feels, particularly sitting in a political position in some of these sort of contested areas. So over to you, Jeremy. Thanks, Meg. And thank you for the invitation and good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I think both David and Hannah have covered the ground really well. So let, let me try and pick out some of the points that they've made. Um, add some colour to them and then perhaps make a couple of other perhaps even controversial points that might stimulate some debate in the rest of the session. So um, first of all, I think what David says about the importance of putting on a statutory footing some of the structures we've been talking about is vital. But I think it's also important to understand some of the other things that his bill does and which the Committee on Standards and Public Life proposed in Standards Matter 2 when I was uh, was a member and not surprisingly I stand by what the committee said on that occasion. And when you look at, for example, the independent advisor on ministerial interests, which is an important check on the behavior of ministers, that is a position that stayed vacant for too long to start with. So the importance of putting something like that on a statutory footing is I think it creates an additional pressure to ensure that the job is filled at all times. That's the first and most important thing. If you're going to rely on an independent advisor, there has to be one. And I think the balance to be struck here is between the powers that the prime minister must have because he or she is the elected head of government and the powers that an independent advisor who is not elected should have. And it seemed to the committee, to me, and I think to David too, that the right balance is to have the power for the independent advisor once appointed through the processes that he's described, to be able to initiate their own investigations rather than wait to be asked to commence an investigation. I think that's important. 
then to be able to determine whether a breach of the ministerial code has taken place. But then, of course, to pass on to the prime minister the decision to be made about sanction. And I think that's the right democratic balance. It must, of course, be for the prime minister to decide who serves in their government. But I think it is at the very least invidious for a prime minister to be trying to work out whether someone else has breached the ministerial code, a code which, by the way, of course, the prime minister will themselves have drafted and published. A new version of it goes out for every prime minister. And therefore, the, the prime ministerial authority is exercised in the drafting of the code in the first place and the deciding of the sanction at the end. But the bits in the middle should, in my view, be the, the province of the independent advisor. Um, what the government did, of course, was pick out the bits of that report they liked and not the bits they didn't. So we also recommended there should be a range of sanctions available to the prime minister so that the only option wasn't to call for the resignation of a minister. And I think that, again, is important. Not every breach of the ministerial code is of equal severity, and therefore it's appropriate that the prime minister should have a range of sanctions available so that they don't, frankly, tie themselves in knots trying to find no breach of the code because they recognise that the only consequence would be, in their view, a disproportionate one. On Aqaba, this is a really difficult problem. Because once ministers, and it's particularly ministers we're concerned about here, have left office, there aren't as many levers on their behaviour as you might ideally like. But I think probably what you have to do is think about some of the levers that you can effectively backdate. So when someone takes on the responsibility of being a minister, there are certain of the expectations on them set out. They're not least they're invited to read the ministerial code, which of course they should do. But I think not enough is done at that point to explain that when you come to leave office, there will also be expectations set upon you and the government expects you to meet them. Now, in the end, if you choose not to, the question will be, as Hannah says, what's the sanction? What's the consequence? Now, whether we can do this through some contractual means, I don't know, because it's nearly not a contractual arrangement becoming a minister. You don't sign a contract when you start. But I do think we need to look at whatever methods we can use. One thing that does occur to me is that Quite a lot of ministers who stop being ministers would quite like to be ministers again, or they would quite like to have some other government appointment one day, whether it's appointment to their lordship's house or whether it's something else. I think what we could do, and we could expect governments to do, is to set out very clearly that if you fall foul of the ACABA rules and ACABA says that you have, government will follow through on that by ensuring that you do not receive any further government appointment. Now, that will affect those who, as I say, stop being ministers but hope to become one again. It will also affect those who believe they might be in line for some patronage further down the line. But it will be for government, of course, to make it clear that that would be the consequence of falling foul of the ACABA rules. Otherwise, I fear, as others have said, we will see those rules continue to erode. But then I want to say something about um, the way in which uh, standards bodies are treated, as, as Hannah referred to. And of course, the, the current example, um, Boris Johnson never fails to give us material to discuss in these conversations, so we're grateful to him at least for that. But there is, of course, the current example of the House of Commons Privileges Committee report on Boris Johnson. And there is no doubt in my mind, whatever reservations I may have, and I do have some, about the conclusions that that committee reached, the way in which their report was treated by those who support Boris Johnson was clearly unacceptable. And if you do have a scenario in which the appropriate counterattack is seen to be to undermine the authority of the committee rather than to argue about the details of its conclusions, then that is a wholly pernicious and corrosive atmosphere in which to try and maintain standards. However, um, I do think it's important to do two things. First of all, not to deify regulators of any kind. They are all fallible, and it is obviously the case that you may disagree perfectly properly with a conclusion whilst not challenging the authority of the committee. The courts, of David knows well, manage to do that all the time. We call them appeals, and you don't necessarily dispute the authority of a court simply by disagreeing with its judgment and seeking to have it overturned. The same must be true when we consider regulatory structures in this space. And of course, the House of Commons Privileges Committee is a very clear example of that, because what the House of Commons Privileges Committee does is not decide on the consequences and sanctions for members of parliament. It makes recommendations to the whole House of Commons, which is then the decision maker. So it must follow from that that you must be entitled to say, I don't particularly agree with what this committee have done um, without necessarily challenging its authority. And we need to make that, that separation clear.
The final thing I want to say is about the tone of the debate more broadly, because one of the things that we've talked about in forums like this before is the way in which political debate has changed over the last even, I think, decade, perhaps less. I think social media has a large part of the blame to bear, and it's certainly sharpened these problems. But political debate has become more, anti more antagonistic. It's become more tribal in a way. Um, I think we've lost sight of the ability to disagree with one another's judgment without doubting one another's motives and doubting their character. And the reason I say all of that in the context of this debate is that I think there is a real risk that if politics becomes more and more like that, and you identify with people who you think are the good guys against the arguments of those you identify as the bad guys, it's more possible to think that everyone on the good guys side should be forgiven certain discrepancies or certain missteps because they are in the end one of the good guys. It's a sort of species of the good chaps problem that Tanner was describing earlier on, but it's one that's added to our difficulty because of the nature of our political debate as it stands. So I suppose what I'm really saying is I think there's a responsibility to main high stand, maintain high standards on everybody involved with the system. But I don't think that the role of the public, the political audience, journalists and everybody else who hovers around these debates is non-existent. I think there is a role for all of those people to say we want a better class of political debate conducted by a better class of politicians, all of which we will get if we get standards right and if we take standards seriously. Because uh, if we don't get all of those elements right, then I'm afraid we're in a downward spiral where we have fewer and fewer good people putting themselves forward for political office and the quality of our political debate continues to decline, leading to the public feeling more and more disenchanted by what they're being offered. So there is a much, much broader argument, I think, that feeds into this. Um, but perhaps I'll stop there and let others contribute to it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That's three really strong sets of remarks full of ideas that um, I'm sure is getting you all thinking about your questions. Uh, we've had uh, only a few questions in so far. So now that you've heard from the speakers, um, this is your opportunity to put something into the Q&A uh, anonymously, if you prefer, uh, that we can pick out in a few minutes and, and put those questions to the speakers. But let me just start out by um, getting us going on a bit of discussion among ourselves. Um, there are some really big issues here. One thing, one thing that I think comes across to an extent from what all of you are saying is the balance between political controls and kind of regulatory independent controls and the extent to which they should be statutory and, and, and so on. Essentially, how much we should be trying to regulate the elected, I think is a real dilemma in this kind of space. I mean, we've done, I've already referred to uh, our democracy in the UK after Brexit project, which has done lots of public opinion work. And what we get from that is that people are really fed up with politicians and they want much stronger regulation. They like independent people. They even like judges to control politicians. Now, I think we've alluded to the fact that that can't be the complete answer because, of course, you know, we, we need people who are democratically legitimate to be able to have uh, this, the support of the public. We need somehow to get back to that. And I've been rather hoping that the Privileges Committee might help us get there because it would show politicians regulating themselves. But of course, we've seen this episode whereby there's another set of politicians who are trying to undermine the politicians who tried to do that job. So going around the panel, I think I'd be interested in your thoughts on sort of political regulation versus independent regulation, how we get that balance right so that we haven't got sort of independent people who are seen to be too powerful, but can we rebuild faith in some uh, more political controls? I see that David is unmuted, so why don't you go first, David? I was unmuting defensively, but uh, <laughs> the chance. thank you. Yes, it is a question of balance. Um, a, a good example, which uh, Jeremy touched on, was um, how far the independent advisors' powers should extend. I was listening to a very senior politician yesterday um, suggest that the independent advisor should not only um, determine whether there's a breach, but decide on the penalty. Now, I think deciding on a range of penalties available to the prime minister is one thing, and I would support that. But actually deciding on the penalty would be would be a step too far. I think you also mentioned the role of the, the judges. And here, I suppose we're in um, contentious territory on Miller 1 and Miller 2. 
I strongly support both those decisions from a constitutional point of view, because it seemed to me what the court was doing on both of them uh, was uh, defending, if you like, Parliament against um, attempts by an overmighty executive to bring it to heel. It wasn't trying to dictate policy itself. It was trying to um, preserve or reaffirm the, the, the supremacy of Parliament. Um, but it was interesting that a lot of people said, you know, this is a judicial constitution. We don't want a judicial constitution. We've always had a political constitution of this country. And, you know, those are powerful arguments. <laughs> but when the Privileges Committee comes along, the absolute exemplar of a political constitution doing its job and members of parliament sitting in judgment on their own, the same people uh, appear to object just as much to that as they do to the judges. And it makes you wonder, really, whether the objection is is not to one sort of constitution rather than another, but just to anything uh, that that trammels the power of the, of the of the elected government. So I think to some extent one one has to accept that you know there is a role for the judges, um, there is a role for uh, independent uh, re regulators, and um, not everything can be left uh, purely to the political process. And just finally on that, um, very interesting just to come at what Jeremy was saying from a House of Lords perspective. And you know, you made the argument very strongly um, that it's important that the Privileges Committee doesn't have the final word, and it all has to be debated in the Commons, and they must be the decision maker. Um, I'm not saying that's wrong, but um, certainly from our perspective, our recent experience of that has been rather painful. Um, you might remember um, that our own committee looked into the conduct of Lord Leicester um, and um, made um, a pretty strong recommendation, uh, or I think would have made, he'd already resigned, but I think the recommendation was he should be banned from participation in the work of the House for several years. And of course, he's now died. Um, but at that time, we did have um, a full parliamentary debate. And it was an absolutely vicious debate. And I'm quite sure it did the reputation of the House of Lords no good at all. And it wasn't just a debate on, you know, was the sanction excessive or did they take everything into account? It was a debate that went right to the heart of, of whether it um, followed a, um, a fair process. It was a dress rehearsal, if you like, um, for the attack that Boris Johnson made on the, the Commons Privileges Committee. And it was said there was no right to cross-examine and therefore it was a kangaroo court and so on. And it was really, bearing in mind, we'd had a, an independent commissioner look carefully at it. We'd had a legally advised commission come to a very um, punctilious judgment. And I should say I was a character reference for Lord Leicester. So I certainly wasn't part of the lynch, lynch mob there. I thought it was a, a very demeaning um, spectacle. And as a consequence of that, we have entered into some sort of, uh, not sure if it's a convention or a practice or a habit um, but now when we get these committee recommendations, uh, we, we, we debate them formally, but we wave them through. And, and our sense is that that's um, you know, a lot less painful. Mm, that's very interesting and, and very, very challenging. I think I can see Jeremy nodding, but Hannah is unmuted. So yeah. Hannah, would you like to come in first? And then we'll go to Jeremy on this. this there's some real dilemmas here, aren't there? There are. I mean, I think is I, I wanted to pick up on the same sort of um, contradiction that David does. That the history of the self-regulation of of by parliamentarians of their own standards has gone in one direction. You started, you know, we started with electoral law being handed over to the judges. Then we had, you know, expenses which used to be handled by MPs themselves, which you ended up with sufficiently bad behavior the, the decision was that that needed to be given to an independent body most recently we've had um bullying and harassment um and an independent process set up and every time this happens politicians in the debates in which these independent sort of more independent processes are set up sort of bewail the loss of self-regulation which is of course key to the you know, fundamental to, to Parliament in a in a um, parliamentary proceedings type way, um, and yet they are where they are. And it, but there is this you know big contradiction between people saying we have a political constitution; it ought to be up to politicians to to determine and enforce the rules, and and yet it, it does, the, the, we don't seem capable of sustaining that position. Now, I, I personally feel that there's a there's a real difference between things which are to do with administration and money and HR and so on, where there isn't, you know, those aren't reasons that politicians go into, into to politics and there isn't any reason they should be held to different standards than, than the rest of the population. And then there are things to do with the actual running of parliament, where I think it is really important that parliamentarians, and this is where the Privileges Committee comes in, need to be able to, to make those judgments for themselves. And there is no external body that can, um, that should, 
determine if Parliament has been impeded in its own work. That ought to be something that Parliament is capable of, of doing for itself, and it's important that it does. Um, so I think those things are um, are different, but I I do think it's, there is an irony in the fact that the people who really don't want the courts involved in anything end up continuing to to trash a system. Um, talking most you know recently about the the privileges committee attacks, uh, which is the alternative, having a more rules based legalistic system because if you're really saying that it, there's, there's no way that it can ever be fair if it's done by peers to their own um within parliament then then you sort of push to a certain logical conclusion which they don't appear to want either so it is a very difficult situation yes that's very very true yes jeremy yeah i mean it, it is obviously as you say very very difficult i mean let, let me perhaps um pick up on a couple of things david said and then come back to the the central dilemma that, that this question um is posited upon. So, I mean, I agree with what David says about the debate on Lord Leicester. It was profoundly unedifying. And, and I think he's right that the, the best scenario here actually is that although Parliament must be the ultimate decision maker, it would be better if it made that decision swiftly and without comment. It would be better not to have a debate at all, I suspect. And there are some, of course, of the recommendations of the various standards bodies in the House of Commons, and I'm sure in the House of Lords too, that do just go through without any debate at all. And that's, that's I'm sure, um, preferable. I would say, um, I don't think that the debate on the recommendations of the Privileges Committee in relation to Boris Johnson was a particularly good debate for all sorts of reasons, but at least you could say this for it, the preponderance of contributions were defending the system rather than attacking it. And I think that's important. Um, I think that the defence of the system is, as I said earlier, not inconsistent with a disagreement with the detail of the report, but you do have to defend the system if the system comes under attack. As far as courts are concerned, I mean, as, as most people here will know, I was on the wrong end of Miller 1, and therefore um, I perhaps might be expected to say it was a dreadful decision. But I will say this for the process that we went through in Miller 1, Actually, the arguments were not about executive versus legislature as much as they were about how do you interpret what the legislature meant in the exercise of its sovereignty. So the government argument was essentially that Parliament had already decided, it had already devolved authority to the executive, and that was in the exercise of its sovereignty perfectly properly, and therefore we should take that as the decision and move on from there. The argument the other way was no, no, that was not a decision to take away the authority of Parliament on this particular question, and therefore Parliament must decide. The huge irony, of course, of the whole process was that having reached that conclusion in what was advertised as the biggest constitutional case of a decade or a generation or a century, whatever it was, the actual process of Parliament agreeing when it came to it was pretty meek and mild, and it did overwhelmingly. But leaving that to one side, let's come back to the fundamental dilemma, which is about parliamentary sovereignty, really. And it seems to me that the way to look at it is this. Parliament must have sovereignty. Parliament must be able to decide things for itself on the issues that Anna described. But Parliament is also able, and frequently does, to devolve its sovereignty to various regulatory bodies. It can do that in regulatory bodies outside Parliament, and it can do it inside Parliament. So Parliament decided a long time ago to say that certain decisions should be made by the Privileges Committee. And where a matter is referred to the Privileges Committee, its report would then be considered later, but it would be allowed to do its investigation. The investigation must therefore be left unmolested, and the system has to respect the fact that Parliament decided to give that authority to the Privileges Committee. So it is not an undermining of sovereignty for the Privileges Committee to do its work. It's an example of it. It's Parliament saying this is how we choose to dispense our sovereign right to decide. And therefore, what was truly pernicious, I think, about the behaviour of Boris Johnson and those who supported him was that they were not consistent. They said, first of all, yes, OK, we'll vote to refer this matter to the Privileges Committee. And there was not a single vote, including Boris's own, cast against that proposition. They then said, and Boris said, interestingly, um, on more than one occasion, both in evidence to the committee and then subsequently in writing, that he decried the language like kangaroo court. He said, that's not what this is. I have full respect for this authority. And then of course, when it came up with a verdict he didn't like, he changed his mind and said, well, of course it is a kangaroo court. 
So I don't think this is a matter of sovereignty. I think sovereignty can be dealt with in a number of different ways, but quite routinely, actually, Parliament parcels out its sovereignty to other agencies. And that's an exercise of the sovereign rights that it has. But once it's done so, it's not entitled to take back that sovereignty when it's done so in a way that it authorizes an agency to make decisions, even about Parliament itself. So if you don't like the fact that an agency is exercising that kind of authority, A, you shouldn't have given it to it in the first place, and B, if you think it's appropriate, take it back, but not dispute every individual decision in every individual case. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I mean, there's, there's quite a lot in the news today, obviously, about the Privileges Committee report, and it's tending to focus rather on the individual names, the Nadine Dorries, Jacob Rees-Mogg, etc. But if you actually look at what it's recommending, it does seem to be recommending something which would try to contain these debates, trying to seemingly offer some guidelines for, for these kind of debates that might have got around the Lord Leicester problem as well, I suppose. The recommendation says that um, ask the House to agree that where the House has agreed to refer a matter relating to conduct to the Committee of Privilege, members of this House should not impugn the integrity of that committee or its members or attempt to lobby or intimidate those members or encourage others to do so, etc. So I suppose what we're, we're, we're trying to edge towards a slightly more regulated system of debate um, along the lines that you're that would be consistent with what you're talking about. Let me just um, keep your questions coming in. Let me ask you just one or two more things and then we'll go over to the audience. I'm rather struck that um, thinking about, again, specific changes, maybe I'll roll these two questions together because otherwise we'll end up taking too, up too much time. If we go everything from the small changes to the large changes, one of the very large proposals, or it seems to me rather large, that's on the agenda that nobody has referred to is um, Labour's proposal of creating an Integrity and Ethics Commission, which would in some way merge the bodies that exist and create some, it feels like a bit more of a sort of super regulator, which makes a lot of sense in terms of uh, people feeling that the system is rather fragmented and maybe difficult to navigate. But CSPL itself raised some concerns about that kind of approach. So the Labour proposal doesn't seem particularly well fleshed out at the moment. I think the space is there to influence it. So I, I'd be interested in members of the panel, what advice they would give to Labour in shaping or, or, or scrapping, if you think that's more appropriate, the idea of an integrity and ethics commission. And then to squeeze in the other question, because otherwise we'll take up too much time, which we're trying to ask on all of the panels. Um, if you could recommend one, what we might call quick win, um, perhaps to be implemented by Rishi Sunak right now, actually, the kind of thing that he could perhaps achieve without legislation, because there's quite a lot that can be achieved in this area without, what would that be? He stood on this ticket of in, in integrity and accountability and professionalism, and some people are now complaining over some of the recent things that have gone on. Uh, and I could talk about HOLAC. Um, it's very hard not to. Um, but is there one single thing that you would recommend to Rishi Sunak to do now in this area to improve the, the, the standards landscape? Um, Hannah, why don't you go first? Thanks, uh, Meg. I think, um, I mean, the simplest, most straightforward thing that, that Rishi Sunak could do, in my view, is um, change the tone and and set and 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 sort of stand behind uh, his general assertion that he wants a government of, of integrity and accountability when there are specific instances uh, which call upon him to do so. So, you know, I, I thought it was unfortunate that he didn't um, wasn't available to vote on the on the Privileges Committee report. Many um, more than people predicted of his colleagues did, um, and he wouldn't even be drawn on expressing a view on, on, on the conclusions. And I think when there has been a, a process, as, as, as Jeremy said, he, he might wish to, to say that he didn't agree with the, with the conclusions, but not to express a view either way, um, I thought was unfortunate. And, and similarly, when, um, when, the, the, uh, when Dominic Robb resigned his, his role, I thought it was unfortunate that in his letter responding to, to the resignation letter that uh, Dominic Raab uh, had written, which was again a real attack on the process rather than a, a addressing of the of the um, of the charges, 
there was absolutely no mention of the grounds for the resignation in Rishi Sunak's response. So I think that the standard systems really fundamentally only work when the tone is set from the top and people think that the person at the top really believes that what they say um, and is prepared to, to, to be on the record in doing so. And, and that he's, he will no doubt have opportunities to do that between now and whenever the next election may be. <clears throat> in terms of the, the Labour proposals very quickly, um, I mean, I think there is, this comes back to what we were discussing before, but there is a big issue. If you have a super um, ethics commission, uh, who, are, who is on it? Who appoints those people? And then what powers uh, do, they, do they have? I think there was a strong case that the, the whole ethics standard system is fragmented in the way it has grown up. I mean, we're very lucky to have it in many respects, in many ways. We, we've covered ourselves for lots of different situations over time as they've arisen through the good offices um, declaring an interest of the CSPL, you know, since it was set up, um, you know, in, in setting a framework and then making lots of recommendations about different bits of bodies that would be useful in different circumstances. But it is fragmented. So something about consolidation, um, I think, uh, is not a bad impetus in order to help people understand the rules, because, you know, it was notable when, for example, um, the David Cameron uh, lobbying uh, sort of controversy arose, Nobody could actually point to a rule that he had broken, but lots of people felt that it that he hadn't behaved appropriately. And so, if we are in a situation where it's not where there are rules, there the are situations people feel that people shouldn't get into, but the rules don't cover them, that could be resolved potentially a bit by by having a more overarching structure. Um, I think I would probably say my advice to Labour would be to leave um, Parliament out of it and to to stick uh, with the rest of the landscape um, because of the. Uh, uh, the, the complexities around parliamentary sovereignty. Okay, terrific. That's some good, clear advice, and I'm sure you're a person Labour wants to listen to. Um, David? Well, you tempt me onto the grand of the House of Lords. Um, of course, the House of Lords is full of ideas for it. The House of Lords form. Appointments Commission, of course, is not in your bill because HOLAC, yeah. because uh, well, CSPL didn't recommend that it made statutory, it was made statutory, but they didn't recommend against, they just thought it yeah. was outside their scope. So that's why statutory was, House and Lords Appointments Commission. Yes, that's why I was selflessly going to recommend to Mr Sunak that instead of adopting my private member's bill, he adopts the private member's bill in the name of Lord Norton of Louth, uh, which would give HOLAC statutory force and give them the power to say whether someone is a fit and proper person. Uh, I could see politically that would make sense. It's, it's in the public mind one of the gravest abuses that political patrons can put their cronies into place. And um, there is a relatively simple thing that you could do. Of course, it doesn't begin to solve all the dilemmas that surround the House of Lords, not least the question of numbers and, um, and the balance of composition. But I think from the point of view of public perception, it would be a very positive thing to do. On the Independent Ethics Commission, I, I haven't really looked into it. Um, my only uh, comparator really is a recommend recommendation I made some years ago in the field of investigatory powers, you know, secret surveillance and so on, where there was at the time a plethora of tiny regulators, you know, very distinguished judges with no help who are regulating this, that or the other. And I recommended they all be brought together into, into one group, which did, did in the end happen in the Investigatory Powers Act 2016. I think that's been a great success, partly because um, a larger body will attract good people who, who want to work there. It has a bit more gravitational force um, and uh, consequently it, it can become a bit, a bit more professional. Um, but I appreciate that's only one side of the argument, but it's probably the side where I would incline to start. Very generous of you to suggest that he should adopt somebody else's private member's bill except your own. And of course, if you would like to hear from the sponsor of that private member's bill and you weren't at our Parliament session yesterday, Philip Norton was on that panel. So do uh, listen to the recording of that when, where he talks about the bill a little bit. Jeremy. Well, perhaps I should start having been critical of a previous Prime Minister slightly defending the current one. I mean, I, I, I take Hannah's point. I think there can always be improvements in the ways in which Prime Ministers represent their position and in sending the right signals. But to be fair to the current Prime Minister, I think um, if you look, for example, at the resignation of Nadim Zahawi, what you saw was a close attention to making sure that standards were upheld. And I think if you believe what we're told, and I don't speculate as to how accurate it is, but if you believe what we're told about what transpired between Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak about Boris's resignation on his list, what Rishi Sunak did was say, the, uh, most, the appointments that have been approved by Holak I will approve, and the ones that weren't I will not, despite your urging otherwise. And I think that's probably the right 
approach for him to take. On an integrity and ethics commission, I, I'm also not a fan. Um, I don't suppose the Labour Party is going to take my advice, but if they were to, I think what I would say is there are two dangers here. One is that it becomes a very political body very quickly because of the status you seek to give it. There will always be an attempt by people on the other side of the political argument to make use of it, to make political points, not standards points, and to tie it up with investigations that it really shouldn't be carrying out. But also, I think there's a danger that if you set up something that you advertise as a super regulator on ethics, everybody else in the regulatory world puts their feet up and says, well, this is not a matter for me. That's a matter for the super ethics regulator. And I think that would be a mistake, too. We have to make sure that if any of the change in ethical observance and standards observance that we've been talking about in this session is to take root, everybody has to see it as their problem. And everybody has to see it as a matter for them, not as a matter for somebody else. So those are my two reservations about that. And in terms of one thing that the Prime Minister could now do, I, I do think because attention is quite rightly concentrated at those at the top of government, those who hold ministerial office, who exercise considerable authority, particularly these days, I do think standards there have to set the right example, which is why I do think that the measures we've talked about, about the independent ministerial advisor, which could be enacted very quickly, the Prime Minister could do without legislation, I think are necessary. Uh, if they're not going to be done voluntarily, then I think he could do a lot worse than adopting either David's bill or Lord Norton's bill, um, or possibly both, and making sure that that does happen. Because I think unless you set that sort of example from the top layers of government, you won't see any of that benefit percolate down. So if he were going to do one thing, I would say it would be that package of measures and do them quickly. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've kept the audience waiting uh, long enough. So, Tom, why don't you come back on the screen uh, and tell us what you've got from audience questions and maybe give us um, a batch of three or something. And those answering shouldn't feel that they need to necessarily answer everything. Um, you can cherry pick. And the more you cherry pick, the more we might get some more questions in from the audience. Tom. Okay, thank you, Meg. You're a bit um, quiet. A bit quiet. Sorry, is that better? That's better. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, we've got lots of really good questions coming in. Um, the first batch of three uh, are themed around the problem and dynamics around it. So the first one comes from an anonymous questioner who asks, um, and this builds on some of Hannah's uh, identification of the behaviours, what would you identify as the causes of declining standards and when the, did the decline begin? Um, next, from Gareth Morgan, uh, would the reforms being proposed by the speakers have any real effect if the public votes for populist leaders who have little belief in following the rules? Um, and then the final question of this batch is from another anonymous user who asks, do you think that exceptionalism plays a part in government and parliament resistance to further codification of standards and repercussions that they like to believe that an outdated idea of gentleman's honour can still be effective because they are special in some way? Um, which uh, would not be deemed sufficient in another workplace. Okay, that's terrific. There's some very broad questions there. I'm, I'm tempted to think that maybe Gareth has answered Anonymous's question by talking about populism um, and causes. But uh, Jeremy, why don't you come in first this time? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Good questions. I mean, I, I think causes of declining standards, who knows? I mean, I think, I think the first thing I'd say is we probably do need to recognise that certainly when you talk about politicians, politician stock has never been that high. So we, we can, of course, always focus on recent problems and say it's never been as bad as this. And in many ways, it hasn't. But of course, as others have said already this morning, as these scandals have occurred, they have been dealt with to some extent by the establishment of mechanisms which take some of these things out of the hands of MPs and remove the temptation. But I, I, I'm not sure I've ever known a time where politicians have been particularly lauded by the population or believed in, in the sense of being honest, good and true. But I think it is probably worse than, it, than it's been before. Um, and I think, you know, well, do the public vote for populist leaders? Yeah, well, maybe they do. Although, I mean, I have a sort of perhaps naive, enduring faith in the British voting public that actually what the British voting public really want is they want competent leaders who will at least attempt to do the right thing. And their view of what the right thing will vary depending on the circumstances. But I do think the public believe that standards are important. Some of the research that David referred to at the beginning, I think, indicates that that is the case. 
Um, and I think we are not having sessions like this because the public don't care about it. We're having sessions like this because the public do. And therefore, we need to come up with some form of response. And finally, on the exceptionalism, I think I think, I think the exceptionalism in, in question here is not so much that MPs think that there's this sort of gentleman's agreement way of dealing with standards that means they don't need proper rules. I think the exceptionalism problem occurs because of parliamentary sovereignty. I think it occurs because members of parliament think that if something were to be imposed upon them that uh, that detailed a sort of externally drafted set of rules, it would undermine the importance of parliamentary sovereignty. And parliamentary sovereignty is important. So I think there's this ongoing worry among those who are thinking about these things properly, that if you did have an external body imposing standards upon the House of Commons, it wouldn't just be inconvenient for the House of Commons, it would start to call into question who actually has the authority to act. And it must be the House of Commons because the House of Commons is elected and democratic sovereignty relies on that being the case. So I think if there's exceptionalism in the argument, it's exceptionalism as a function of the parliamentary sovereignty point, rather than the behaviour of MPs must be allowed because MPs are special in some other way. Which does raise the question about the MPs, doesn't it? And in response to the, the stuff that the Privileges Committee is saying is some of the same things I was saying to the Administration Committee when I gave evidence a couple of weeks ago that MPs need to defend their institution. Uh, and if that's not inculcated in them, then um, you know the buck stops with them. And they need to be accountable for and better at promoting their own good behaviour. Um, and, and admittedly, it is true that the ultimate sanction is the electorate saying, I don't want this person representing me anymore. But the reality is that's a sort of fairly widely spaced check, because at the moment we're talking about four or five years uh, between parliamentary elections most of the time. Um, and secondly, elections are about more than the behaviour of individual members of parliament. So it, it is, of course, is a valid ultimate check, but I don't think it's sufficient. Mm. And we are, of course, coming up to an election at some point in the not too distant future, and there will be a new intake. And maybe we need to be thinking about the, the induction processes and so on for that new intake, because otherwise a culture can take hold. But um, David, let's come to you next. Uh, right. Well, you asked us to be optimistic, um, Meg. Um, so I wonder whether you talk about declining standards. I wonder if if that is a given. I don't know whether standards are declining or not. Perhaps I haven't been in public life long enough to have my own experience. But I would have thought um, partly it's to do with increasing standards in other workplaces, um, making it plain that um, you know Parliament is deficient in some respects. Partly it's about greater transparency and partly it's about, for example, the Me Too movement. Um, we have a lot of standards investigations in the House of Lords. A lot of them are about uh, you know, rudeness to staff, uh, harassment of staff and so on, sexist behaviour. And I just wonder whether these things, in fact, have always gone on, but have not been um, picked up so much before. Um, certainly as someone who was new to politics, you know, when I came into the House of Lords five years ago, uh, I expected MPs to be much more unpleasant, much more partisan, much more political in a way than they are. I, I'm still surprised sometimes when you talk to people who've been snarling at, snarling at each other in a television studio and, and find that uh, they have genuine respect for each other's views. So perhaps I have a rather uh, idealistic uh, view, but I, I take some persuading it's actually getting worse. It's certainly becoming more visible and, I, and it certainly needs more done about it, but that's not quite the same thing. Um, what will be the good of these reforms if um, people continue to vote for populist leaders nothing and there is nothing you can do with rules that that is a substitute for the good judgment and the good temper of the people um michael sandell um writes absolutely fascinatingly about this you know how until 50 or 60 years ago you look at something like you know the, the advent of antitrust law and the people promoting it were not promoting it on the basis of lower prices for the consumer which is all people think about now they were promoting it on the basis that it's good for the temper of the population that they should be self-employed or work in small units because that way they will be good citizens and they will exercise good judgment whereas if they are wage slaves and huge companies then they won't there's a whole way of looking i think at politics that uh, that most politicians just don't dare tread into because it sounds a bit moral or moralistic or something like that but the problem with the populist leaders in my view is the way the political parties allow their leaders to be appointed and that's probably not a standards issue and then exceptionalism uh, uh, yes, I mean, I'd like to think think about a different sort of exceptionalism, which is British exceptionalism. I'll just give an example in case there are any constitutional nerds watching and, you know, why wouldn't there be an event like this? 
there was a very interesting session of the Constitution Committee on which I sit yesterday morning in which we uh, had the opportunity to ask questions of all three law officers. And among the issues that we touched on was the rule of law. Of course, the rule of law is a statutory concept. It's in the Constitutional Reform Act 2005. But it was very striking that um, although there are um, well-worked definitions of the rule of law uh, reached by the Venice Commission and the Council of Europe, there's one in um, the EU, which is the conditionality rules, which they use to decide whether places like Poland and Hungary should continue to receive funds because they insufficiently respect the rule of law. You know, that's been spelled out. It's been adjudicated on by a court with 25 members. They've argued about all its various ingredients. But the overwhelming sense we got was, oh, well, in England, it's much better to, to, to stay flexible. And, um, you know, as, as uh, one of them, the Advocate General for Scotland, for whom I have the highest respect, um, put it to me uh, in answer to one question, the attempt to pin the matter down risks running into problems when succeeding law officers in a succeeding government do not share the same views. In other words, even something as fundamental as the rule of law um, shouldn't be defined just in case the next people that come along want to, want to take a different view of it. And I think that, that there is an element of exceptionalism there, the, the idea that we muddle through and that the flexibility of our constitution, which of course is in some some respects a great advantage, uh, is so priceless that it can um, acquit us of the need to sometimes um, square up to the fundamentals and work out what's really important and put it down in writing. Hannah, I know you've thought about these things a lot. I should have mentioned at the start your excellent book. Is it called Held in Contempt about the House of Commons, uh, where I think you talk a lot about exceptionalism, actually. But um, exceptionalism, populism, your thoughts. I have an entire chapter entitled Exceptionalism, so I do have thoughts. Um, uh, they are, uh, I, I don't disagree with, with what's been said. Just to add to it, I think, I agree with uh, Jeremy that part of it comes from part of the if the, the the problematic form of exceptionalism comes from the absolutely right and proper form of exceptionalism. You know, MPs are exceptional and have a different status for very good reasons within our democratic system, and you know, and we we do have a system based on parliamentary sovereignty. But I think that that. Um, also, I think there's something about, um, which is a historical accident, but the fact that the parliament meets in a royal palace, which together give parliamentarians a sense of, of their own status and exceptional status, which can just bleed beyond the good and proper reasons into a more general sense of, oh, but we're different, oh, that we're special, which if unexamined can lead to, to, to inappropriate behaviours. Um, and so I think it's it's really incumbent on on politicians to, to think through well, where where are the points at which you know we are special for good reason and and we need to be able to exercise those powers and have those protections and those privileges and where is this not actually the case? And the thing that I was um, when I gave evidence to the <laughs> administration committee thinking about is actually I think parliaments should spend more time thinking and talking about how it is the same as other places actually helping people to understand parliament by saying well you know you know the governors of your primary school you know your your, your you know your your local councillors when they do this the things that people can identify with the roles that po the politicians play the role that parliament plays which is in many ways is analogous the good governance principles which operate in any company or, or organization i actually think parliament would, does itself a disservice by constantly defining how it is different when actually people would see the value and the importance of some of the ways in which it is, it operates if, if more time was spent drawing analogies and then parliament saying, and we wish to be the very best version of this that we can be. You know, we want to be the exemplar institution, which is similar to all these other different levels of governance and, and structures within our, our policy, which in some ways are mini, mini microcosms of, of what we're trying to do in Parliament, and that that might get more um, sort of traction with the public than, because I think that, that when you look at your polling that you've done, Meg and your Citizens Assembly and so on and, and other polling, the thing that really, really cuts through to the public on this stuff is the one rule for us and another for everyone else. That is that is the single, you know, people, most people have no idea who Owen Patterson was or Chris Pincher or any of these sort of things which we in the Westminster bubble have sort of got really exercised about. But this sense, which I think was why party gave it, got such cut through, was this sense that politicians think there's one rule for them and another for everyone else. 
And, and that is the other side of the sort of exceptionalism coin. And it is really corrosive. And so to go back to uh, the point, I think that, that Jeremy, you're making at the start, it feels to me that too often um, parties put a short-term political advantage ahead of this bigger this bigger picture. And they say, well, in this instance, we can understand why this rule was broken and we're going to try and find a way to sort of forgive or rehabilitate or, you know, lessen the consequences of this, this specific instance of, 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 of rule breaking because we can rationalize it in some way. And they those instances are always viewed as independent uh, instances where there's a good political reason to do the thing you're going to do. But actually what the public see is an accumulation of instances in which the rules don't get applied in the way that they believe that they would be applied if, to them if they were in the same situation. So I think that is a real a real um, thing to think about. In terms of declining standards, I agree with David. I think that to some extent it's to do with um, changing changing views in society of what's acceptable. I think certainly some of the Me Too type um, cases that we've seen, which you know some some examples of really uh, bad behaviour. In Parliament, which is not an exceptional institution, is bad behaviour in lots of institutions, but these have come out, they've become more visible because what is acceptable in a workplace has, has changed. And we now have systems which enable people to object when these things happen. So that is part of it. But I do also think to mention, to be the first person to mention the B word, that in the very re in recent years, that the Brexit has made our politics more oppositional and uh, to go back to what Jeremy was saying at the start, um, th there's a there has been that single issue, and it's not alone, but did more, I think, to make um, uh, our, our, our politics very, very tribal for a period in, in, in a way which was very corrosive, which is having some lasting effects, I think, in the way that politicians behave. And but, but maybe to try to end an op optimistic note, Meg, Maybe the next election will provide a, a, a fresh starting point on that and a, and, a, and, a, and a reset for all those politicians who remain in Parliament and the new ones who, who join, and maybe we'll be able to move uh, into a different phase. Okay, great. Um, we're rapidly running out of time, but let's see if we can quickly bring in some more questions because we're due to finish at quarter two. Uh, Tom, do you have other things for us? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so the next little batch of questions are about government and reform and challenges to reform. So Rosa Whiffen uh, asks, well, says there seems to be a high degree of consensus, for example, that the independent advisor on ministers' interests should have the power to initiate investigations into breaches of the ministerial code. Um, but the government has been reluctant to implement this recommendation. Similarly, Duncan Haynes uh, says that excellent CSPL reports gather much dust waiting for meaningful engagement from government. So the question here is, what does the panel think explains this reluctance and how could standard setting gain more traction? Um, and relatedly, um, a question from an anonymous user, which is, uh, which of the actions that you consider important uh, can the government get on with on its own, but which does require legislation, for example, creating enforcement powers. Um, so this is how important is, the, is a new statutory framework uh, to safeguarding the system. So just two broader questions here. Okay, terrific. So it, this is basically all about making it happen. Are there small things the government can get on with? It, with how important is the statutory framework, and how can we, how can we give it some impetus? Um, David, why don't you go first? Okay. Well, on the um, uh, advisor on ministerial interests, uh, to be fair to the government, they have moved some way in this direction. I, I, I don't. Jeremy probably remembers the exact words, but I, I think now the advisor does have the power at least to recommend that he be asked to investigate something, although the prime minister still has a veto. I, I think it needs to shift further, but credit for that as far as it goes. Um, why did none of these things get get um, implemented? I don't know. I'm very naive. I thought when the Conservatives had a leadership contest, since the previous prime minister had fallen for ethical reasons, um, ethical considerations would be at the forefront of the debate. And I naively wrote to um, both candidates, <laughs> um, drawing attention to my private members bill and hoping they would take it on board. I listened thereafter very carefully to everything they both said about ethics. I don't think Rishi Sunak said anything except he was committed to integrity. Liz Truss said, you can trust me, I'm from Yorkshire. And uh, yes. maybe that, that was all the membership uh, wanted it's, to hear. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we were we were in a disorganised way on the same team on that because we wrote a set of questions which we should be asking the candidates around this and 
hope that the broadcasters would do it and they they didn't there was very it, little it goes back to the question of you know the electorate gets the the leaders and the politicians that it deserves and and if the public as a whole care about this as i'm sure most of them still do um then i can only imagine that uh, the parties will need a, a pitch at the general election when it comes on this subject and that um uh, in some cases they're going to be making some quite far-reaching recommendations hannah um, our, our polling shows the public do really care about honesty and integrity, uh, and it looked like Rishi Sunak had, had noticed that and, and uh, voiced it early on. How can we get some action in these areas, do you think? Yeah, I, I, your polling does say that. I, I, I don't think we can get action until the politicians actually believe that it's something that's going to change the way people vote. I think when they're asked about it in in a in a poll and whether they think it's important, that's that's one thing. But when they go to the ballot box, is that the deciding factor? And I think that in part is why it's important that we do have processes which operate in between elections to enforce standards and and that we now have a recall of MPs Act specifically in that area because that means there can be consequences uh, which happen outside the ballot box. Um, in terms of uh how we can get get movement on that I, I think that is the that is the key thing if if but i'm not sure that it's ever going to be an electoral uh issue uh on the other hand uh, again maybe i'm naive i would think in in this coming next election it might be a issue on which uh the parties feel there's a there's work to be done to differentiate themselves from governments from recent governments and and to articulate how they would do things differently, even if it's not the key messages. Um, so um, I apologize, my battery's maybe about to run out. So if I suddenly disappear, that's why. <laughs> We've got three minutes. So <laughs> Jeremy, um, you get the last word. I mean, it strikes me in listening to Hannah that Angela Rayner seems to have been rather good at trying to politicize this. You know, she's she's throwing stuff at Sunak all the time on this and trying to get public attention onto it. So. Does does that work? And are there steps that um, we can? Yeah. Be, well, look. I mean, I I, I I think um, that for an opposition, standard stuff is always a good sword. I I think we probably for governments, whichever government it is, by the way, need to start to think a bit more as a shield because it seems to me, and I can't explain why these things haven't had more take up. I as with other people on the panel have consistently argued that it should, but to no avail. But but it does seem to me that part of the argument being very pragmatic about it for any prime minister is just look, not just as David says about some of the recent issues that have dominated the fall of leaders, but just look at how distracting from a government's agenda standards problems can be. You can be massively distracted from the narrative that you're seeking to pursue. And your time as a prime minister is immensely precious. And I think if you took the amount of time that the current prime minister has had to spend seeking to resolve what he's going to do about various standards failings on the part of people in his government, it's a far bigger slice of his time than it should be. So I would frankly be making the argument in number 10 to say, not only is this the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do. You do not want to be spending your time trying to decide whether one of your ministers has breached the ministerial code or not. It is invidious for you to do so. It's time consuming for you to do so. Far better that you devolve it to somebody else, somebody who, by the way, you pick and whose parameters in terms of the ministerial code you draft yourself. So the risk is not that great, but it does at least enable you to carry on doing what the public expect you to be doing, which is to run the country. So I would say that's the argument. Um, I, I do think that, you know, when it comes to public polling and all the rest of it, I, I do think the public can, can uh, care deeply about standards. I do, however, I'm afraid, maintain the view that there is too much eliding of standards with broader political questions. There is always the risk that if you ask somebody, do you think this politician is honest? And they answer no. What they may be saying is, I don't think this politician is honest, but I'm afraid they may also be saying, I don't agree with this politician. I don't think what this politician is saying to me is right. And I'm afraid unless politicians and everybody else in this miasma get away from the idea that it's not possible to disagree without disagreeing with someone's motives as well, then I think we will continue to see this eliding of two different things. We need to be able to say as politicians, I think 
this politician is honest. I think they have good motives. I think they have the country's best interests at heart, but I think they're profoundly wrong. I don't think there's any wrong with that line of political argument, but it isn't deployed anywhere near as often as I would like. Mm. And indeed, the public rather like it when you do that. Um, so there's definitely some options for change from the top, which doesn't necessarily require legislation, but just, as has been said here, some different, some different attitudes and practices. We are now out of time. Um, let me just go back to remind our audience that the recording of this session will be made available soon. There'll be a video on our YouTube channel and it will appear as a podcast um, in the coming weeks. So do please subscribe to our podcast uh, and look out for information about when those things are available. If you're not already uh, signed up to our events mailing list, please do do so and make sure that you're first to hear about our future events by following the Get Involved link on the Constitution Unit's website. And this is the penultimate session of the conference. The final session takes place at 5.45 today when I'm going to be in discussion with former Conservative Deputy Prime Minister David Liddington and former Labour Lord Chancellor Charlie Faulkner to talk about implementation of constitutional reform. So they've both been right at the heart of government and that promises to be a fascinating discussion. Um, this webinar is going to end in a moment, uh, but you can click again on the same link just before 5.45 to get into that closing session. But it really just remains for me to say you have been a fantastic panel. This has been a rich and fascinating and um, uh, thought provoking discussion. I'm not sure we know all the answers, uh, but we've delved very well into some of the questions and we've got some practical tips uh, for those who are putting together their plans. So thank you all very much for being here. Thank you to the audience for being here and for all your questions. Sorry we couldn't get to them all. Thanks to Tom for fielding those questions and for the team behind the scenes for helping this to enabling it to run smoothly. So thank you all very much and hope to see you again soon. Bye bye. Thank you.